R.B. Kuyper wrote a book about the church entitled The Glorious Body of Christ. And early in the book, he discusses Christ's prayer for the unity of the church found in John 17, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And Kuiper raises a question about this prayer. If the church is already spiritually one body, as the Bible teaches, because we all have one Lord, and are all indwelt by one Spirit, and are all one family under one Father, then why does Christ pray for our unity? Why does he pray for a fact that it already is? Kuiper's answer is simple and I think helpful. Basically, the unity of the church is something like the holiness of the Christian or the holiness of the church in that it is real now, but it is not yet fully realized. Here are Kuiper's words. He says, a comparison may be helpful to discover the answer. The Christian is holy. Every Christian is a saint. It may even be said that in principle he is perfect. And yet, how obvious that the very best Christian needs to grow in holiness and has a long way to go before he shall have ever attained the goal of perfection. In much the same way, the spiritual unity of all who believe in Christ is indeed a present reality, but its fullest realization and the attainment of its highest degree lie in the future. The spiritual unity of the church <clears throat> is both real and to be realized, end quote. <clears throat> now he goes on to di discuss some of the divisions in the one body of Christ, and he makes a distinction between good and healthy divisions versus sinful and unhealthy divisions. Good divisions he calls simply the multiformity of the church. Here we might think at a most basic level of churches of various language groups. They're divided into distinct congregations, but their distinctness from one another only shows the manifold glory of Christ who saves people from every tribe and nation to engage in the worship of the one Lord. Sinful divisions he calls schisms. Schismatics separate from other Christians not over fundamental truths that have to do with true worship or with salvation or the healthy, a healthy church community, but divide over obscure teachings and practices. The reality of what I'll call hyperdenominationalism, that is the incessant fracturing of the church into more and more divisions, is a mixture Right, of both multiformity, the good type, and sinful schism. I think most Christians long for greater realization of a visible unity of the church that corresponds to our spiritual unity. But the history of hyperdenominationalism is often seen on a smaller scale in the local church. How easily have fellow church members become estranged from one another, even over non-essential matters. A schismatic spirit was at work in the church in Corinth. In chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? 
Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? In chapter 2, verse 3, Paul identifies their divisiveness as sinful schism by saying that it arises from carnal or fleshly desires. He says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, or another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Perhaps most alarming is that this schismatic spirit was showing up when they were supposed to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now I say they were supposed to be celebrating the Lord's Supper because Paul says that their divisiveness was so sinful and disruptive to the proper administration of the Lord's Supper that it could not even be called the Lord's Supper. Take a look at chapter 11 and beginning at verse 17. Now this I say that I declare unto you, I praise you not. This is not chapter 10. That's what we read a moment ago. This is chapter 11. Okay. I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest, made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Right there he says it. You, you all call this Lord's Supper, but you have not come to eat the Lord's Supper. It's not what you're doing. For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper. And one is hungry, and another drunken. You see the disparity here? The division? To the point that you have some who are, whose stomachs are growling, and others who are uh, so over-intoxicated right, from their revelry. All this in one church body. What, he says, have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Like a good father, Paul knows the power of the carrot and the stick. He gives encouraging praise where appropriate. And he expresses disapproval where appropriate. But Paul doesn't stop here, right? He doesn't leave them simply rebuked for their divisiveness and their abuse of fellow church members. But he shows them the way forward. He goes on to give them instructions about the proper administration of the Lord's Supper. I, I wonder how many books on church unity and healing divisions have a chapter on the Lord's Supper. Just curious. But why would Paul try to heal divisions in the church by bringing them together around the Lord's table? Why would he offer the Lord's Supper as a remedy to this schismatic spirit? Well, the answer to that question is found in our text from this morning. For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The Lord's Supper answers the problem of sinful divisions because at the Lord's table, Christ nourishes the communion of his body. So we begin with the second half of this verse because Paul begins that clause with the word for, which expresses the ground for the first half of the verse. How can Paul say that we are one bread and one body? For or because we are all partakers of one Christ. In the second half of the verse, Paul says that Christ is that one bread that nourishes each member. For we are all partakers of that one bread. The bread here referring to Christ. The bread of life. And specifically signifying the human nature of Christ. Now, bread may make us think, of course, of the material nature of Christ, because bread is a material substance. But here we must insist that the bread signifies not only the material aspects of Christ's humanity, but that it signifies his entire humanity. 
In the Shorter Catechism, question 22, it asks, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? And the answer is, Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, we might say a reasoning soul or a rational soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin. So the definition of the human nature is given here as a true body and a reasonable soul. Now that Jesus had a true body is evident in the words that he spoke to the disciples even after his resurrection, recorded in Luke 24, 39. He says, Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And that he had a human soul is evident in his words in John 12, 27, as he contemplated the suffering of God's wrath that he would endure for his sheep at the cross. He says, Now is my soul troubled. Likewise, in Matthew 26, 38, Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. My soul is sorrowful unto death. Jesus' divine nature suffers no such fluctuations. There is no suffering in the divine nature, but Jesus' human nature has both a material and an immaterial aspect, a true body and a reasonable or a reasoning soul. So that one bread speaks of the human nature of Christ that was broken at the cross in sacrificial death. But that one bread has been resurrected in glory and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's where that one bread now sits. This is the one bread of which Paul says we are partakers. The Greek is actually a verb here, of which we all partake. So how do we partake of Christ's human nature when we receive the bread of the Lord's Supper? The Westminster Confession of Faith explains Jesus' words in the Gospels and the Apostles' words in the letters on this uh, subject in chapter 27, paragraph 2. It says, There is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and And the thing signified. In the case of the Lord's Supper, there is a sacramental union of the bread as sign and the human nature of Christ as the thing signified. Right? Bread is the sign. The human nature of Christ is the thing signified or spoken of in the sign. So Jesus challenged the Jews as recorded in John 6. Verses 55 through 56, using the words flesh and blood to speak of his human life. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Robert Bruce, the Scottish pastor and theologian, who succeeded uh, James Lawson and the reformer John Knox at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. In 1589, he preached a series of sermons on the Lord's Supper that are now published together under the title, The Mystery of the Lord's Supper. These are beautiful expositions of the Lord's Table that uh, lay a solid foundation for the following generation of theologians at the Westminster Assembly. In these messages, Bruce says that just as the stomach receives the bread and the wine through the mouth, so the soul receives the body and blood of Christ by faith. He says that, the, that faith is the mouth of the soul by which we feast on Christ. The bread and wine, they do not change in substance as Rome falsely teaches nor do they carry the physical body and blood into our stomachs. But we do commune in the full humanity of Christ, given in sacrifice and raised in glory by faith. 
Bruce is clearly echoed in the larger catechism in question and answer 170. The question asks, how do they that worthily communicate in the Lord's Supper feed upon the body and blood of Christ therein? The answer says, as the body and blood of Christ are not corporally or carnally present in, with, or under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper, and yet are spiritually present to the faith of the receiver, no less truly and really than the elements themselves are to their outward senses. So they that worthily communicate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper do therein feed upon the body and blood of Christ, not after a corporal and carnal, but in a spiritual manner. Yet truly and really, while by faith they receive and apply unto themselves Christ crucified and all the benefits of his And we note how Paul subtly undermines any divisions in the church by emphasizing here the word all. We are all partakers of that one bread. We all refers to all discerning members. In the next chapter, Paul explains the importance of self-examination and the ability to discern the body of the Lord by faith. So discerning members are capable of self-examination and of understanding the body of Christ. While this is a warning to unbelievers and to young children who have not developed discernment, the emphasis in verse 17 is on all. All discerning members partake of that one bread. At the Lord's table, we all partake of the benefits of Christ's sacrificial death, the cleansing from sins. The healing of the soul, which we looked at last week. We also all partake of the benefits of Christ's glorious resurrection. Remember, that one bread that we partake of is now ascended and seated at the Father's right hand. He is alive forevermore. This means that by the power of Christ's resurrection, we have the ability to live a Godward life. This is a benefit of communion with the living Christ. And under the reign of Christ who sits at God's right hand, we are authorized to exercise dominion through the proclamation of the gospel in our various callings that God has given to each of us in this world. And that there is one bread, we are reminded at the Lord's table, that there is no other source of salvation in Christ alone my hope is found. There are not several loaves There's only one loaf, there's one Christ, there's one way of salvation. Now, all that we've just seen serves as the ground and the rationale for Paul's statement that we being many are one bread and one body. The Lord's Supper heals divisions and fosters unity because nourished by that one bread, we are united as one bread. Notice that Paul does not say, for we being absorbed into each other are one body, or that we being absorbed into Christ are one body. He says, we being many, even in our union with Christ, we do not lose our individuality. Even when Paul says in Galatians 2.20, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, He continues to refer to himself as I and me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So there is a good and glorious multiformity, to use Kuiper's term, multiformity to the body of Christ as each of us retains distinct traits as individuals while being united to each other in the bond of Christ. The language of one bread, one body, expresses the unity and community of Christ's people. As Paul explains elsewhere to the Corinthians, the body is made up of many members. And each member needs the other members as well as serving the other members. If we are all identical, we could not serve one another well. 
Right? The hand benefits from the eye. The mouth benefits from the hand. The stomach benefits from the mouth. Each member has an important part to play in the care of the whole body. Each member is important for the effective functioning of the body. And this is strengthened by the Lord at his table. The Lord's Supper nourishes our unity in the loving exercise of the liberty of conscience. In the following chapters, or I'm sorry, following verses of chapter 10, Paul applies this unity in Christ to the exercise of Christian liberty. We don't use our liberty to run roughshod over those who have different scruples than us. Rather, we may, like Paul, even restrict our own liberty as a courtesy to others. At the same time, we do not use our scruples to bind the consciences of fellow believers to rules that God has not commanded. In chapter 11, Paul applies this to our humble service to each other at the Lord's table. Rather than selfishly taking food and drink with the faction of the church that we have affinities with, we wait for one another so that we all partake together. We try to portray this even here in our gathering at the Lord's table at Spruce Creek. The elders serve each of you first. I serve the elders. And finally, one of the elders serves me. And then once we have all been served, we eat and we drink together. In this way, the Lord's Supper nourishes our unity in humble service to one another, not only around the table, right, but everywhere, at all times. Finally, in chapters 12 through 14, Paul applies this to the exercise of spiritual gifts. The Lord's Supper nourishes our unity in the loving exercises of the gifts and graces that Christ has bestowed on us by his Spirit. This is right in the middle of that section, right in the middle of chapters 12 through, what's, what's in the middle of 12 through 14? What number? 13. Right. Right in the middle of that section, in chapter 13, Paul gives a beautiful exposition of Christ-like love. And this is the love that is displayed to us and is conveyed to us at the Lord's table. May it also be the love that we show to one another at the Lord's table. And in all of life. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Father, in answer to our Lord's prayer, may you make us one that the world may believe that you sent Jesus as your, as the Savior of your people. May your glory be manifested in our love. Amen.